If I had to pick just one tank as being my favorite of World War II, it'd have to be the T-34. I love the shape and the raw industrial finish of the parts, as well as the impact they had on tank design and the outcome of the war. I've long had the 35th scale Dragon bedspring armor version in the stash, and I'll get to that one day, but given my tight build schedule, I turned my attention to the downscaled version I picked up for $5 at a swap and sell, and I'd build myself a 72nd scale bedspring armor that wasn't actually bedsprings, T3485 to add to my collection. The kit seemed to be a reasonably straightforward build, so I'll try and move swiftly through the construction phases and get to the good stuff for you. I'd been given a set of Russian colours from the new range of Atom paints by Ammo, and I wanted to trial them on a model, so this subject seemed to perfectly fit the bill. One of the things I wanted to improve this year was my ability to slow down and read the instructions properly. So the fact I wasted time on making fuel tanks that wouldn't be required suggests that journey has yet to begin. The kit comes with a heap of photo etch that is predominantly for that mesh armor. I wanted to try something different and pre-treat the etch using a blackening fluid. By dabbing the etch with the fluid on the brush, I was able to blacken the screens in the hope that the treatment would aid in the paint adhering to it at a later stage. Unfortunately, I discovered that handling the etch was damaging the integrity of that finish, and I'd later sand it back, but I wanted to share that with you for your own knowledge, in case you were wondering why the etch looked black throughout the video. My journey with the etch began with bending the grill for the engine deck. The kit comes with a molded version or the option to have the part as etch. The grill on the deck of the T-34 is one of those fine details that makes a big difference to the finished model. So once that part was bent and slightly rolled, it could then be attached to the frame using a super glue. Super glue is crucial when working with etch as regular modeling cement will not hold these parts in place. I could then fit the etch vents from the air intakes, assemble the detail on the rear plate and fit that and fit the external tanks that would soon find their way to the garbage bin. The spare tracks are a single piece assembly and were pretty bland if I'm being honest. I added detail with a blade to give the impression that they were individual links rather than just a solid piece. Some additional fine detail comes in the way of screens for the engine deck. The etch is very fragile and care is required not to damage the part. A small touch of super glue was used to hold those grills in place. The top deck and the hull could now be attached and the T-34 was starting to take shape. One of the key features of Soviet armor was the rough and industrial looking textures left by the casting process of the turrets. Even though I was working in 72nd scale, I wanted to try and replicate that on this model. Etch alternatives are supplied for the guard over the mantlet as well as the lift hooks, so those molded details were removed using a sharp knife. I then marked and drilled out the locating positions for the grab rails so as not to lose their positions once the texturing process began. The two halves of the turret could then be assembled and the turret was ready for the texturing process. A small amount of Tamiya white putty was mixed together with Mr. Cement to create a diluted mix of that filler. An old brush is then used to stipple the paste over the parts of the turret that required that casting texture. Pleasing results are achieved by stippling over the same area multiple times and building up the peaks and valleys in that soft putty. Once the putty is dry, the effect can be lightly sanded, which removes some of those high points from the effect, leaving you with a more realistic looking cast finish. The roof of the turret can now be assembled, and you might notice I'm using blue tack to hold the hatches in place for the painting phase, because I want to leave myself with the option to pose them open on the finished model.
The lift hooks are replaced with the tiny etch alternatives and are set in place again with a touch of super glue. Onto the wheels now and they are first prepared for paint by fitting them to toothpicks using a blob of that versatile product, Blue Tack. Having them attached to the toothpicks makes them easier to handle and paint and then set aside to dry. They first undercoated in a Mr. Surface of 1500 black. It was here I realised the bed spring version of this tank I was wanting to build didn't have the exterior fuel tanks, so they had to be removed. The gaps were first plugged with styrene sheet and then filled with a putty. Once dry they could be sanded and prepared for the primer. Rookie error, but I wanted to show and share with you the setbacks as well as the victories I have along the way. It's all part of the journey of scale modelling. Rookie. The model could then be primed in the Mr. Surfacer Black and prepared for the paintwork. You may have seen a few weeks ago the review I did for the new range of Atom paints from Ammo. The tests I'd done were encouraging, but I wanted to put the paint to the test on an actual build, and this was the perfect subject to do just that. There is a lot of conjecture online about the need to thin this paint and it is what it is. All I can tell you is how I use them and I most definitely thin it using the appropriate ammo thinner. The 4BO is thinned to about a 50-50 thinner to paint ratio and shot through my 0.3mm airbrush at around 15 psi. I'm looking to build the coverage up in an imperfect way. I don't want to flood the surface with the green, but I want to apply it in a slightly mottled way so some of that black undercoat can filter through giving me an irregular finish. By using the black from the primer, I'm able to help establish simulated shadowed areas around the shapes and recesses. The paint seems to have an excellent coverage over the black primer and has a lovely eggshell sheen to it. The centres of the wheels also receive the 4BO coverage. Yellow green is a great way to create a faded and weathered look to the 4BO base coat and the trick to applying it is thin the paint to a point where it becomes quite translucent. I've thinned this to around 65% thinner, 35% paint, although it's all done by feel. I haven't actually calculated that out. By keeping the paint thin and translucent, I'll be able to better blend the colours and create smooth gradients in that paintwork. A quick test spray shows how fine and cleanly I can get the thin paint to spray. For my first round of highlights, I focus on the horizontal surfaces and around details like the hatches. You can see the life the highlighting starts to bring to the colour. This is always a stage I find so satisfying in the painting process. I then look to catch the leading edges of the turret and create a smooth gradient falling down the shape of the sides of that turret. The same techniques are used around the body of the tank. You can see the pop in the colour giving life to those areas that would be subject to the most damage from the sun and the elements. There is always debate as to the realism of the technique. For me though, modulating the colour sets the foundations for future weathering and it's all about expanding the palette as much as I can because weathering tends to visually compress the base layers of the colour. Colour modulation when factoring in layers of weathering plays a crucial part in the overall process. I'm also able to create soft vertical streaking by releasing a small amount of paint and moving the airbrush in a downward motion. A drop of white and a couple of extra drops of thinner to the yellow green and a second round of highlights can then be applied. I am again applying the same principles I used in the previous round of highlighting, only this time I'm reducing the coverage of the paint so as not to lose that initial application of the highlights. I try to consider the way the light might fall on the shapes and work on those areas. 
The contrasts in color can draw your eye, so I work on the top side of that barrel as well as lightening up sections of the turret roof. A mix of basalt grey and black grey is then used to brush paint the rubber sections of the road wheels. I'd usually use black grey for my rubber colour, but painting a couple of tones lighter in these smaller scales is always a good idea to combat the scale effect. It helps to present a more authentic looking representation of the tank. The tools and spare tracks are also painted in the grey colour. This will serve as a base for further painting at a later stage. It was now time for the decals and the model was coated in a high gloss lacquer varnish from SMS. The coarse texture on the turret will test the ability of the decals to settle, so the high gloss finish will give me the best foundation to work from. I'd added Mr. Mark Setter to the toolkit through the week and this was the perfect opportunity to use it. The liquid was first applied on the model and the decal was slid into place. Once the position was correct, the Mr. Mark softener was applied and a soft brush was used to stipple the decal over the textured surface. The stippling motion will help remove the air from underneath the decal and allow it to settle into the surface. A cotton bud can also be used to aid in this process. The decals and the application technique was flawless and presented beautifully over that heavily textured finish on the turret. On the 24th of April 1945, Soviet High Command issued an order that special air recognition markings be placed on all vehicles fighting in the advance on Berlin. Recreating this was just a matter of painting the stripe using white acrylic paint and a fine brush. In reality, the stripe would have been hand painted, so some imperfection in this detail would be considered appropriate on the model. Although it's going to be tricky to see once the model is built, I wanted to weather the areas around the track guards and in behind the wheels. AK Terrain's paste is a water-based paste that will create mud-like textures around the swing arms and recesses in those areas. Diluting the paste with water helps soften it and allows me to apply it around the model in a controlled way using a soft brush. I'm not concerned with the colour, this is just about creating volume in those mud textures. Once the paste had had time to dry, Tamiya Buff is used to blend the areas and create a dusted finish. I'm not looking to flood that area, but create gradients from the mud paste to the 4BO colour. I then went back with a heavily thin mix of red brown and focused the darker colours around the deepest recesses in those details. Subtle streaking is also created using this heavily thin mix and building the coverage up with multiple passes. The effect is really pleasing, but it'll soon be covered up with the wheels I painted earlier. The vinyl tracks in this kit are pretty ugly and are screaming for an upgrade, but I decided to use them nonetheless. The two ends are attached using a spot of super glue and some pressure from a pair of pliers. Black brown acrylic paint is then used to apply the base color for the tracks. Vinyl tracks can be temperamental with even the mildest of solvents, so I'm painting them with this acrylic paint to try and offer them a sense of protection if you like. They held the paint surprisingly well and I was able to feed them around the wheels with a little help from my airbrush needle soon after. The vinyl still had a lot of flex in it, so the solution to that was as simple as applying super glue to the connection points with the wheels and then holding them in place till the glue set. Small pieces of sponge were used to keep downward pressure on the connection points at the top section of the track whilst the glue was setting. The tracks weren't perfect, but adequate given the scale of the model. There is always a great deal of back and forth when I paint, so you'll see me applying many layers of washes as the finish evolves. The initial pin wash is a dark brown enamel paint and is focused around the panel lines and details. The brown tone tends to settle the colours established in the earlier steps. It visually darkens the overall look but helps lift the details around the model. 
After around 15 minutes, a cotton bud with white spirit can be used to clean up and remove the excess wash, leaving the dark paint in and around the details on the model. Soon after, the model is sealed using a matte varnish from VMS. This will ensure any subsequent layers of weathering will not reactivate these foundation layers. The matte finish also gives a truer representation of the tones in the greens and provides a better surface for the oil paints to adhere to that I'm planning on using in future steps. Shading is one of my favourite things to do and would present a true test for these Atom paints. I want to keep the paint thin in order to achieve a shaded effect. So one drop each of the 4BO and the matte black added to the thinner in the cup. I'd guess it was about an 80-20 mix of thinner to paint. I first test the flow on a piece of paper towel and get the feel for the paint flow on the underside of the model. This technique is all about control and takes a lot of practice, but it is so rewarding to execute. By introducing the darkened tones to the lower edges of the shapes and around details, I'm able to create a visual volume in the paintwork. Vertical streaking can be built up with this method and is a great way to make those small scale models appear larger than they are. I'm working on re-establishing panel lines and shapes around the model. You can see I'm applying the colour around the bolts on the rear deck and am creating shadows around the raised details. Details like that maintenance hatch can be enhanced by leaving the highlights around the top half and then shadowing the bottom half. The shading works in unison with the washes I applied earlier to give an overall presence to the finish. Fitting these mesh screens was something I was dreading due to the fragile nature of them. I mentioned earlier the etch was treated with the blackening fluid, but during the handling process the coating seemed to chip and misbehave, so I lightly sanded it back in case it became an issue with the painting phase. The screen assemblies were then glued together and the screens were pre-painted in a Mr. Surfacer black primer and then with the 4BO. Fitting these fragile screens was done using super glue and was a time consuming and delicate operation. Seeing them all in place though was extremely satisfying and they were surprisingly sturdy. Trying to fit the turret to the model with the screens attached would have been a tricky proposition so it was fit in place and the armour was glued around those shapes. The last screen was attached to the roof of the turret and that stage was complete. The colour I pre-painted the screens meant they were blending into the model and I wanted them to be a little more obvious given they were the hero piece of the model. By applying the yellow green again to the screens I'd be able to visually lift them off the model. I just had to be careful of the angle I was spraying at so as not to get overspray through the mesh onto the tank itself. Three tones of rust coloured acrylics were used to pick out the spare tracks and the exhaust pipes. By keeping the paint wet it allows it to be semi-transparent which will work with those grey base tones to present an interesting old worn look to those parts. The headlight was painted using a subdued silver colour so it was not too obvious. In hindsight I probably should have drilled that out and tried to improve that part a little. Chipping is a colour in the new Atom range and was sparingly applied to the screens using a sponging technique. Given the small scale it's important to remove just about all of the paint from the sponge prior to dabbing it against the parts. The chip should be extremely fine and almost impossible to detect with a naked eye at a model of this scale. Back to the buff and a dusted layer is lightly sprayed to the lower edges of the model. Each layer of weathering can tend to soften the previous layers so an oil wash is then used to reintroduce some of those shapes around the model.
The burnt umber oil paint will blend and dry a lot softer than the enamel washes would, which is great because I'm looking for these washes to be a subtle inclusion. The oils can also be used to block in areas that would indicate grime and weathering. The dark colour works well in the shadowed areas and the dust colour can be used to simulate dust accumulation. A couple of small deposits of the oil paint are dry blended into the surface to create the effect. The matte varnish I applied earlier is helping that oil paint bite into the surface, but the oils are still soft enough that I can blend and feather them using the tip of a filbert brush. The top of the armoured shroud over the bow machine gun clearly shows the ability this technique has to add that weathered look, but it's also enhancing the highlight on that shape. Loose ground and dry step are enamel paints with a high pigment content and are a great way to create realistic looking weathering effects straight from the bottle. My paints are old and do require some persuasion to come to life, but once mixed through I'm able to use a brush loaded with the paint and speckle it onto the model by flicking it across a toothpick. A combo of the light and dark colour is used to build up the effect, but just like with the rust it's important to remember the specks and spots of mud need to be in scale. Any specks that are too large are easily cleaned using a brush moistened with white spirit. The high points of the tracks are then dry brushed using a silver acrylic paint and the model is again sealed in a matte varnish. The last matte coat is another area of conjecture online, however I find it seals and protects the model and I love the look it presents. Any glossy or wet effects would be added after this stage should the model warrant it. One last touch and that is to polish the machine gun barrel and some of the edges of the mesh screens using a silicon brush and a pigment powder as well as adding the signature black oily exhaust stains from the oil burning T34 engine and the model was done. I wanted this build to tick a few boxes for me. The first being I adore the T34 and I will look for any excuse to build one. But secondly, I wanted to test these Atom paints on an actual build. I have to say the paints exceeded my expectations and I was able to achieve some pleasing results with a minimum of fuss. I enjoyed them so much so that I have a set coming for the Tacom Tiger 1 I reviewed a couple of weeks ago and will be looking to push them to their limits during that build. I often say 70 second scale isn't a scale I usually work in, but yet I find another tiny tank in my collection. I chose to build this kit because I thought it would be a quick build, but as usual I underestimated the time and effort that goes into finishing these models. Yes, the parts count is lower, but often the smaller palette takes a little more thought and refinement with the execution of the techniques and that can slow down the whole process. It's easy to forget just how small this model is and looking at it through the macro lens can be quite confronting, but overall I'm really happy with how it came out. I'm envisaging a small scene with the tank moving its way through a devastated Berlin landscape, but that is still in the planning stages at the moment, so stay tuned for that one. Don't forget the Tamiya M16 competition is drawn real soon, so be sure that you're in it to win it. If I've added some value today, please hit that like button and make sure you're subscribed. I love hearing your thoughts and ideas down below and I'll respond to everyone that comes through. Remember guys, this is the greatest hobby in the world. Share it with your family, share it with your friends and let's be proud of what we do. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks time. Grills, tanks, grills, tank, grills, tanks.